Coming up on Tech Thing, if Bitcoin and Chinese smartphones kill DIY PC building, will GPUs ever get cheap again? The gear we use to record CES 2018, Fing's Fingbox, Thunderbolt GPU enclosures, and ponies. It's all coming up on Tech Thing. Tech Thing patrons have a new build video at patreon.com slash tech thing, and they get early access to the show and a weekly email of our top tech news stories. And hey, you can even participate in hangouts with Shannon and I. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing possible at patreon.com slash tech thing. I'm Shannon Morris. And I'm Patty Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I sound like Yoda. I, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I do sound like Yoda. Sorry, too much? No, I mean, I've sounded like a, 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 a peripheral character dying of consumption in a Dickens novel for the last two weeks. So Yoda yeah. is a big step up. I have to. We feel much better this week, so that's great. Oh, my goodness. My family's still not speaking to me because I got all them oh. sick. Yeah, you know, we've been doing CES. Yeah, CES. We're talking a lot about CES 2018, uh, AMD processors, new announcements from Intel, and the Sir Gorax commented on last week's episode, doesn't matter the prices of CPUs anymore. GPUs and RAM are so absurdly expensive that building a PC now is not a good idea. Huh, you know, I've actually had the same concern, but should I be feeling that way? Because like for the longest time, I've wanted to build a new computer for my house. I'm still running like Windows 7 at home <laughs> on this old crappy machine from like when we first started the show. One, it's not that old. It. It's not one, that machine's not that old. And two, <laughs> it's not that crappy. Uh, well, I mean, it it runs Lightroom really slow. Okay, but so. that's the so case. But you did like a Core i5 processor, right? I did, yeah. So here's the thing. In your situation, you might actually be really lucky because you could upgrade the GPU and get a significant bump in performance, mm. right? Um, and I'll be honest, if you're a gamer or an Adobe, Adobe Creative Suite Maven and you need all of the GPU because yes. you've got like multiple 4K monitors and you're rendering 3D because you are a super gamer, you're doomed. <laughs> oh no. For now. Okay. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Memory though, uh, while the price has gone up, is still relatively cheap if you're building a system with a seven series processor, right? If, you've, if okay. you're spending like $350 for a GPU and 150 bucks for a motherboard, yeah, RAM is more expensive, right. but it's not there's huge a component of the cost. If okay. you're building like a $500 gaming machine and you want $200 of RAM, you're not. You're building a $600 gaming machine. Um, but let's talk about you know some of the stuff that does look good. In terms of CPUs, prices are dropping. Like AMD in particular, uh, you know, basically dropped the prices. This is the AMD Ryzen 7 1800X processor. I bought oh, one of yes. those so we can review it. See that price in the corner? So beautiful. It's $349. Oh, Whoa. Look, it's a hundred, you know, they basically just dropped the price. Okay, uh, they've dropped. Yeah, because like there's going to be a, ri a Ryzen refresh later this year. Okay. So when you look at that part, it is $150 less. It mm -hmm. has gone from five, $499 to $349. Okay. And that's not bad. That's not that's, bad. That's pretty cool. I like that. And I just closed the Intel tab that I had open. <laughs> so if you're looking for an 8th gen Core i7 8700K processor, it's mm -hmm. $378.99. And again, look at that, oh, kids. Oh, wow. You know, it launched at like, 570 okay. and it's down, the prices are dropping. Okay, I'm, I'm liking this right now. Now, if you go to something- This is giving me some potential. This is. Now, if you look at like this Celeron desktop processor, mm -hmm. this one's actually gone up in price, but I'm also pretty sure it's kind of end of life. And oh wait, not it started much, at 50 and now it's at 58, so okay. it's nothing to really worry about. Yeah, that's not a big difference. So if you don't need a 3D GPU for gaming mm -hmm. or for Photoshop, it is a great time to build a CPU okay. or to build a, a computer. Um, the prices are dropping consistently. Memory though, memory's crazy. Oh boy. Okay. Memory prices, we talked about this last summer. We said, look, memory prices are gonna go up. Yeah. I should have bought memory. I didn't need memory, but I should have just bought a couple of 16 gigabyte kits just because the prices have nearly doubled in the last 12 months. No. If you go back farther, the price has practically tripled since June 2016. What? You're talking, like 2017 is like the largest single year increase in memory prices ever. Seriously, oh. I read it in like three different That's articles. That's ridiculous. Well, yeah, and it doesn't help because this, this price crawl start. This is like one of the most popular. Oh um, yeah, Corsair I, Vengeance. I, this is what I'm running in my system, my desktop system. Um, this is one of the most popular uh, memory. Whoa. Yeah, this is like one of the most popular options available on uh, Amazon. Oh my goodness. So it started at like 160 bucks oh, in 2015. Oh, I should have bought it last summer. Yeah, and then it no. dropped, all in 2016 it dropped down to like 70 bucks. Memory 
prices wow. flatlined. So part of the issue is nobody's thinking like, oh, it used to be 160 and now it's 220. Everybody's thinking it used to be 70 bucks. Yeah. It used to be 100 bucks. And now it's 220 bucks, right? Um, you know, looking at another SKU, which is also popular, Corsair's Vengeance, eight gigabyte, you know, that's a hundred bucks right now. And, Whoa. you know, it was, oh, well, it, it bottomed out at like less than 30 bucks. Oh, wow. I mean, that was like for like three days in, you know, June and Is that like Prime Day? I wonder if that's like the summertime Prime Day. It might be the summertime Prime Day. But basically, <laughs> you're looking at it going from like 50 bucks up to, you know, 96 wow. 99 today. So, oh, man. yeah, memory's kind of painful right now. Yeah. Phones are using DDR4 in a big way. Uh, memory manufacturers are pricing basically in revenge from when RAM was cheap. Mm. You bastards! $30! $30 for eight gigabytes, take this! <laughs> Um, and you know, charge what the market will bear. It's a thing, right? Mm -hmm. There is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, back in November 17, uh, ET News, the Korea IT News web, uh, web paper, paper thing, uh, <laughs> quote, Samsung Electronics is going to extend its DRAM production lines at its semiconductor plants located in uh, Hwasung and Pyeongtaek. Okay. Sounds like, uh, literally, apparently, they are going to increase their uh, capacity I think they're generating roughly 30% of the RAM made in, in the world right now, and oh, they're wow. going to increase the total overall worldwide capacity for RAM production by wow. 20%, which will probably motivate the other two big players, SK Hynix and Micron, to produce a ton more RAM. Uh, and while the translation is kind of rough, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the sort of Korean to English translation. Is that translation, Google Translate? I don't know if it's Google Translate or, or, <laughs> or they automate it there, but um, it sounds like Chinese DRAM manufacturing is going to come online between 2018 and 2019. Oh, okay. All of which will work together, hopefully, to eventually drive the prices down. Okay. That said, uh, we pinged Corsair and their senior manager of the memory product line said, quote, we foresee no short-term change in the DRAM supply shortage. Okay. So uh, hopefully in 2018 prices will go down late this year, unless of course phone memory goes even more nuts, like 16 gigabyte Android phones for everyone in China, and the United States, and right. India, and Australia, and Europe, and everywhere else. So I feel like I should, I should come up with an idea to build a computer, buy the pieces that are really cheap right now, and just wait for like the memory to go down in price, and maybe wait for the GPUs as well. So if you pull up now in stock.net, and you know, I mean, take a look at that, scroll down, right? This is like every GTX, NVIDIA oh GTX gosh. GPU that's made right now. Oh, wait, there's one that's in stock. Quick, click on it, see wow, what happens. Wow, that's $600, It's though. $600, uh, which is down from 1,000 or 1,600. Oh, you know why that oh. is? <laughs> it's funny, we're talking about this later in the show. This is like a mobile uh, <laughs> uh, 1070 yep. in an external enclosure. Okay. Um, <laughs> but when you take a look at this, right, check, Gosh. this is the EVGA GeForce GTX 1070 I'm running in my desktop, which mm -hmm. I bought right around here, because I needed a better GPU to review an ah, AK monitor. Yes. And right about here is when Bitcoin prices started to go berserk. Oh, and man. you'll notice as we get into sort of November and December and January, um, oh gosh, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's oh, it, right. So my heart. <laughs> the the prices have consistently been above the MSRP since the card launched, and they're tracking with Bitcoin, which is oh. funny because Bitcoin mining with GPUs has been dead for years. Ethereum mining and some other stuff still works for GPUs. Right. Um, but you need dedicated ASIC boxes to be effective uh, mm. in terms of Bitcoin mining. Okay. So in the last week or two, Bitcoin has dropped roughly half from its peak price from twenty thousand right. dollars down to like ten thousand dollars. Still a lot of money. If you're a Bitcoin nerd, by all means, correct me on the price by email askatechting.com. Um, but hopefully, as that happens, because right now there are no GPUs in stock. Your best shot is to go into something like now in stock.net mm -hmm. and put on alerts for like every GTX 1070 possible because it seems like looking at the records, like a bunch of pre-orders will show up for like a $529 1070, which is way over the like $380 MSRP. Right. But, but it's is, not a thousand dollars. Yeah, right now, if, you know, if you can find one, it's going to be like nine hundred dollars for a four hundred dollar GPU. That's ridiculous. So you know, pre-ordering. Maybe I should steal my husband's. <laughs> you know, you, you, I mean, he's just gaming. So. He's just gaming. There's a recipe for marital bliss. <laughs> I know, right? Honey, I stole just your steal GPU. His GPU. Oh yeah, that would be good. Oh, he'd be so mad. <laughs> oh my goodness. So right now, until like, I have this feeling like as as you know. 10 grand is still a lot of money for Bitcoin, right? Yeah. But I think what seems to happen traditionally is as the prices go down, 
Um, people sell off their GPUs to recover the cost of them and then buy more later on. We'll right. see if that happens. But right now, it really sucks to be building a system if you're a gamer or you need CUDA cores for Adobe's Creative Suite. Um, so I actually priced out my 1800X build, uh, which was like, I built it in April and bought the GPU in June. It was $1,289.26, not counting the case. Okay, So not if bad. I built it today, oh assuming my. I could find the GPU, it would be almost $700 more. It's $1,932.97. Ouch. That's almost all GPU. Oh, Take the man. GPU price out, and it was $889 in April and $833.97 today because my processor dropped by 150 bucks. Oh, I see. So, you know, a lot of people are like, well, what about, what about if I buy mm -hmm. one? Because Dell, they yeah. buy all the GPUs. Lenovo, HP. Yeah, just buy it from the desktop manufacturer. If you search for an NVIDIA GTX powered machine, desktop machine at Dell, this is the only result you get what? currently. A $3,079.99 Alienware Area 51. Oh, wow. Which is crazy. I mean, it's a fantastic system, but yeah. it's a $3,000 gaming system. So if you dig into like some of the Inspiron gaming desktops, you're looking at, oh, where did it go? Where did it go? Uh, AMD Radeon RX 560s, mm. 570s. So it's not even the latest generation Radeon cards. Okay. Um, yeah, they're all... Literally, like the one NVIDIA GTX option is that Alienware Area 51. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. Lenovo's <laughs> got like, so you're looking at a 1050 Ti for 809 bucks, okay. a GTX 1060 for 971. Um, you know, when you get up from, that's the, the Y520. If you go to the Y720s, you know, you're looking at 15, 16, like 1600 bucks to get GTX 1070 graphics. Okay. And a huge amount of that's got to be the GPU. Um, and to go with, you know, GTX 1080, you're looking at 2249. Jeez. Which is probably less than that system would cost you to build if you were trying to find a GPU, if you could even find a GTX 1080 right now. Okay. So, yeah, if you're a gamer, horrible time to be building a system. <laughs> if you just need a faster system, GPU prices have gone down. Um, almost enough to offset the increasing cost or of CPU memory. CPU prices, yeah. So, you know, because like CPU and GPU, or excuse me, CPU and memory prices are almost a wash. Um, <laughs> Jeez. But yeah, GPU prices. They're insane. And, you know. <sighs> so I guess I'm going to be waiting to build a computer, but maybe I'll buy a CPU right now. Since well, apparently they've gone down in price quite a bit. You could probably drop in a much faster CPU than the motherboard you already have. I yeah. And you've got the it's RAM. It's a consideration. And then you just need to sit on nowinstock.net and poach, poach, poach. Which I am really good at. <laughs> That's how I got my Super Nintendo Classic, so I could definitely play that game again. I'm ready. Bring it on. Get me that GPU. Or you could steal your husband's GPU. I I might do that. That's Will the marriage survive? Tune in next week <laughs> to tech. Marital drama GPU stealing show. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, let us know if you have any questions about building computers as well. You can email us, ask at techthing.com, or you can tweet at techthing. We got an email from Marshall. He says, your CES coverage looked great. Thank you, Marshall. What was your rig? Camera, lens, light, audio interface? I was using a Nikon 5300 with a kit lens, cheap 160 LED panel, Ceramonic XLR interface with an SM58 knockoff. Would love to shave a few pounds off and save my back or feet without compromising quality. Thanks, Marshall. Okay. First of all, I'm going to say a big part of the quality of the video uh, you shot at CES 2018 was the camera and the lens, Amazing. which are freaking heavy, Marshall. And freaking expensive, too. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, bought that thing out of pocket. Biggest investment I've ever made and mm. well worth it, too, if you do a lot of videography. Yeah. But yeah, um, I definitely did kill my back, by the way. And some of that has to do with toting around a razor blade in this backpack along mm -hmm. with all of my camera gear for editing in the middle of the day, which I am absolutely not going to do next year because that was just way too much weight on my back because that's like four pounds in itself mm -hmm. just for the laptop. And then you add in the battery itself and the battery is super heavy too. So The nice thing about <sighs> starting making video when people were doing beta cams that yeah. weighed 35 oh, pounds God. is everything <laughs> seems so light now. Yeah, uh, not for me and my back. I'm just like, oh, I can't carry anything. I'm such a lightweight. 
oh my goodness. We've got to get you a go ruck and get you rucking with 30 pound plates <laughs> right. in there. There we go. Training for CES. Training for CES every year. So for the mobile <laughs> podcasting rig, assuming that you can edit everything later and you don't intend to do any immediate live streaming, uh, which if that is the case, I would just recommend a phone on a gimbal. Mm -hmm. it, they work perfectly fine for live streaming, so yeah. I highly recommend that. Uh, I started with my camera, and the camera I use is the Sony a7R II, and with that, I am using a 16 to 35 millimeter uh, f2.8 to 22 lens, and this is the G Master lens, which is amazing for those nice bokeh shots of awesome up close product shots. So literally between those two, you basically own the best camera Sony makes and one of the best lenses Sony's ever made. That's like five It's one of their right best there. lenses for sure. Um, they have the Sony a7R III mm -hmm. out now, which does better video quality and better stabilization, but I was putting it on a tripod, so I don't need the a7R III, right. you know, I can, I can save a few bucks there. Well, I mean, and it, but I remember like when the, when the a7 series came out, people I know who had carried Nikon or Canon cameras and were super fanboys and never considered yeah. literally sold their camera bodies, sold their lenses, yep. and moved everything over to the sun. The sensors in those Sonys are that good, which for $3,000 they freaking should be. Yeah, very much so. But if you want, I mean, it's also like, it's like I've seen shots you've taken at night, and it's just like, oh yeah, oh yeah, you know, somebody's- It does incredible work. There's a candle 20 feet away from this person, and like, oh, you see all the details in their face. <laughs> I'm not really exaggerating that much. But since it was CES, and I did want to make mm -hmm. sure that we had perfect lighting, I also bought this little guy, and yeah. it's only 27 bucks so a great little They're investment awesome. there so for the lighting because I didn't want to end up with any crappy shots of us standing up mm -hmm. uh, I chose to go with this little teeny tiny investment of $27 so great price it's the newer 160 LED CN 160 dimmable ultra it's it's a it's a light with a little hot shoe adapter mm -hmm. and you stick it on your camera and then it has a little dimmable switch on the side and it takes AA batteries so it worked out Ooh. quite well. So yeah, you didn't have great. to buy a bunch of expensive battery packs? No, I just bought a bunch of rechargeables. Awesome. Yeah. So awesome. And then moving on from there, I also got a couple of the Audio Technica AT899 Omni Omnidirectional Condenser Lavalier microphones, which also worked out really excellently. I didn't have to carry around a couple of really big stick mics, mm -hmm. which do weigh more. And these are also rechargeable with little AA batteries as well. And you ran those directly into a Zoom H4n, right? Yes, I've I did. Used, I've recorded hundreds of hours of audio for videos on the Zoom. I have never used a Zoom before, so I read through the manual right before CES, but it was great. It was nice to have uh, something other than my camera recording audio so that I was able to separate out the two different mm -hmm. microphones, so I recorded via stereo. And then we were able to sync everything yeah. in post. And it took like no time to sync in post either because the camera and the audio both synced up perfectly so there were no like bit frame separations or there anything There is one like that. secret though. What? Yes, there is. <laughs> the clap at the beginning of a segment is so important whenever you are syncing audio. And you can't Michael hand it where it's like my friend Michael where he's oh, like yes. or the other one is somebody I knew used to do. <laughs> you have to have the visual. Yes, Sorry. the visual right in front of the camera and right in front of the microphone, but it worked great. Uh, next thing I did is the Manfrotto tripod. Mm -hmm. So this is the tripod that we bring, at least it's something similar to this. It has the same ball head on it, and I believe it's a little bit different of a tri tripod. It's a little heavy, so if y'all have any recommendations for like lightweight, really compact, but also can stand up all the way tripods, I would love some recommendations. I'm not really a big fan of the ball head type that is on here because it's just, it's a little annoying to deal with. Probably put a different head on it. I could put a different and head on it, but I'm not really a big fan of those gigantic legs either. So yeah. I would like thinner, smaller, more compact, because this one kind of just bangs everything around me. So it's a little bit, it's not compact as much as I would like it to be. Tripods are one of those things where you can get a really nice tripod, but yes. there's this point where you go from like, it's a hundred bucks to, it's $700. We do much. And yeah. Yeah. 
carbon the, fiber. There's carbon a lot fiber. of options on Amazon. So if anybody out there has recommendations mm -hmm. for a good, compact, lightweight tripod that I can take with me to conventions, definitely let me know. Did you bring a spare camera? I did. Just in case something happened to my main camera, I did bring a secondary. And mm -hmm. this is just my personal CyberShot uh, point and shoot camera. But it works really, really well. It's the Sony CyberShot DSC RX100 Mark IV. Five, which I bought right before my trip to Japan, and uh, it's a great camera. So I was just like, just in case, just in case I have a backup. Two is one, one is none. Yes, and of course <laughs> for that little camera, also to kind of help with my mm -hmm. own shots, just personal shots when I'm vlogging and stuff like that, I decided to invest in one of these little Joby Gorilla Pods, and those things those. are awesome, and they're cheap. 20 bucks. So I was like, yeah, why not? You know, it's a good little investment to have around and it's super useful. Uh, the next thing I brought with me is a couple of monitoring headphones and that is just to make sure that the audio doesn't suck while we are recording, just to make sure that everything is okay before we stop recording and try to put out a video. <laughs> and that is why we were able to get good audio even though we were around every single car stereo at CES. Actually, it was the Bluetooth speakers in that one afternoon. So we would start recording, and then the guy would put Boost. this horrendous yep. pop song yep. on. Yep. And of course, it's all licensed, so we can't record while the music is happening in the background. But he was really impressed with how it, like, he would turn it up to the point where the speaker was obviously distorting, and he did it every single time. And I'm like, this is not, this is a bug. Yeah. Not a feature. We're yeah. bitter about this. We weren't, we weren't the happiest podcasters. Sick. Today. Tired, starting over <laughs> and over again while listening to horrible pop music on a terrible genie speaker. Genie in a bottle. It with, was genie in a bottle. With the lights. Don't forget the lights. Oh gosh, yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. Rechargeable batteries and travel chargers? Yep, so I just wanted to mention these mm -hmm. in case you're looking for a good rechargeable battery since yeah. everything from the zoom to the, the microphones that I was using to uh, some of the camera equipment all took double A's. So I invested in just a bunch of these little double A and loop batteries from Panasonic. And I also brought the little Panasonic rechargeable that you plug into a wall. It's great. I just let that run overnight and then I have a bunch of powered uh, Panasonic batteries ready to go. And for my camera, I purchase the RAV Power. RAV Power makes awesome yeah. uh, accessories, by you've the way. You've never heard of them unless you bought their stuff. And if you bought yes. their stuff, you'll buy it again. So this RAV Power rechargeable uh, comes with a couple of Sony batteries by RAV Power, of course. So I got two extra batteries as well as a charger that uses micro USB so I could plug it into a USB port and take it with me, which I thought was perfect. And mm -hmm. it's compact, so it doesn't take up a lot of room. Obviously, that just stayed in my hotel room. Uh, for whenever I needed to charge batteries overnight, but it was perfect. I loved it so much. So highly recommend that if you are looking for something to charge batteries for a Sony. And of course, I mention it every time I talk about like going to a convention, my Peak Design Everyday Backpack. I did the 20 liter one, which is perfect for my little back. And uh, even though I had a ton of weight inside of it, it was still very comfortable, which is great. I do wish it had a little bit more arch support because you know, I'm sure the ladies out there can agree you get a little arch going on on your back. So it would be nice if it kind of went inward a little bit to give me a little bit more support there. I usually have a shorter backpack, but I wear it mm -hmm. really high, so it's the weight's all back here. Yeah, and I do wear mine pretty high up, but sometimes I, I, I wish there was a little bit more support down at the bottom as well. Can you well. put a, 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 like a hip belt on that one? There, it do, doesn't come with a hip belt. It does come with one of the belts that goes right here, the but that doesn't straps. really, that's not, it doesn't really and work. Not anatomically effective. It's not very, Go no. Luck actually now has <laughs> curved straps just for the ladies. See, I need that. Peak design, get on that right now. <laughs> I would, I would seriously buy a new backpack if they had like curved straps that are made for a lady's parts. GoRock.com. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to know what your mobile podcasting rig looks like because Shannon's looking for ways to shave some of the weight off of her. Yes. Mobile podcasting. Always. Rig. And if you got a videography question, fire them out, ask at techthing.com because we're sitting here waiting for you to tell us what you're excited about us to cover. Let us know. We'll do all the work for you. We're not coughing. We're so excited to be here. I know. I'm so happy I'm Woo! not sick anymore. Yay! <laughs> Got a question? You want to see us review something? Got a tip or an idea you want to share with the whole Tech Thing audience? Please fire them out to ask at techthing.com or you can tweet at techthing, at snubs, or at Patrick Norton. And hey, if you want to be part of the crew that makes Tech Thing possible, please contribute to the show at patreon.com slash techthing. Thank you for your support.
Back in August, we told you about Fing. It's a smartphone app that finds and tracks practically everything on your network, mm -hmm. wh whether it's wired or wireless. So it's a pretty slick app if you are wondering what's on your network. It's very, very informative. Yes. Now, the crew behind Fing has also launched this brand new thing called the Fing Box. And Patrick got to play with it. So what's it do, Patrick? Well, it blinks. Oh, it blinks. Only when it's not connected to a network. The so, end. Oh Just my goodness. Kidding. Well, okay, before I talk about the Thingbox, um, one quick thought. The latest rev of uh, iOS 11 dot whatever has hidden MAC addresses from apps, apparently making IDing devices more difficult. Mm -hmm. Oh, Apple, why? Why do you <laughs> it's hate- It's more secure. Yeah, why no? They just hate people having useful networking tools in iOS. It's a thing. <laughs> Ever since, like, a, whatever, I won't go on that tangent, but um, in any case, Fingbox uh, built uh, Fing, built the Fingbox, which mm -hmm. is hardware to extend the Fing and give you 24-7 access to what's going on uh, on your network. Okay. Um, it's literally, it's about two inches high, it's a round LED-filled puck, plugs into, there's an Ethernet uh, jack and a micro USB port, uh, and it adds more features to Fing, device blocking, an internet security check, alerts, a digital fence, which I think is pretty slick, a along with fence. digital fence, along with bandwidth analysis, internet speed testing, and Wi-Fi speed testing. Okay. Which you may be excited about, you may not care about. Um, I am excited. In theory, the LED is good. Exciting is good. Exciting <laughs> is good. Uh, in theory, right, the LEDs on the Fing box tell you what's uh, going on, but frankly, there it is. It's kind of a complex system. Okay. So you get white when it's powering up, green pulsing when it's ready for activation, blue steady, which is normal operation, blue half circles, which is new devices detected, blue green spinning counter, no, spinning clockwise is bandwidth okay, analysis, spinning counterclockwise is the internet speed. You get what I mean? Like, like I like That's that confusing. they're using LEDs, but it's completely unhinged, right? Uh. Um, you are pretty much gonna interact uh, with one of two things, either the app on okay. your phone, uh, you know, or you're gonna to go to this, which is app.thing.io. What's uh, this? Well, basically, this is the web interface. There's, there's, there's apps for your, for your smartphone. There's a web interface, uh, and you can also get email alerts. Uh, and what you're looking at right now is app.thing.io. And so this is basically where the information the Thing app captures is mirrored on their servers, okay. which are operated by a third party somewhere in Europe, presumably with tremendous privacy protection. Um, <laughs> Thing anonymizes and collects the data, and they use it to build the Thing device recognition service, which is why things like my Sono speakers or my Apple TV or some of the weird devices in my it house. It automatically knows the names yeah. of those things. Which I love. Yeah. Um, so the whole point is, right, Thing IDs everything on your network, and you can create users, associate devices with users, and for example, use the parental control to maybe shut their internet access off every night at dinner time. Okay. Or schedule pauses oh, at that's bedtime. Cool. It is cool. Um, you can also block devices, which I like. Like, you can yeah. be like, oh, that Bobby plugged in the thing that kills the network in your small office. <laughs> Bam, shut it down. What's kind of a bummer is it won't do this automatically. Mm. Uh, I would love it if a new device is connected to the network and thing just shuts it down because it essentially yeah. does its own internal art poisoning to block things. Oh, All right, it's pretty slick. Yeah, the small net builder crew found that. Um, they, they, you know, they got their wire shark on. And I was like, I was wondering yes. how that worked. Um, it's the best way to check out network reviews. Wire shark. Wire shark, um, baby. You know, I would like it to automatically shut down new devices on the network unless you give it uh, the approval. Mm -hmm. Digital fence, I think in some ways is the most interesting feature it does. It detects access points, right? It calls them stations for reasons I don't know. Uh, it, dev it detects devices that are on your network okay. and devices that are nearby. And then you can mark nearby devices to be watched. For example, say there's a cell phone that keeps sitting around your house for like 30 minutes every night. You can, you know, track it and oh. see if they come back every night. Oh, cool. Or, you know, it could be somebody walking their you dog. You could see if somebody's war driving. You could see if somebody's war driving or if somebody's, you know, sitting outside the house taking pictures or something creepy like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you can even get status changes when it enters or leaves the range of wireless network. So it's like, did the dog walker come? Well, look, the dog walker's phone showed up at noon, just like it's supposed to or something. Interesting. It is interesting. Um, I just like the idea. So I, you can know like whenever Alice comes home to see her son Bob, unless yeah. Charlie tells her to leave her phone in the car, turn it off before getting near your house. So it's like a total <laughs> teenage phone detection system. That's funny. Yeah, I actually like that idea. Um, internet security check remotely scans your router for open ports from the outside. It also checks your internet network for addresses, uh, UPnP. Um, the Fingbox says it can detect the off attacks on your Wi-Fi and alert you uh, and look for man in the middle style attacks and alert okay. you. Did I mention alerting? Yes. I get a lot of emails 
from Fang, especially when like when I when I put the Fing box on and it's like bing, 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 oh, new yeah. device detected, and there's just like giant stack of email, which is cool. <laughs> But I really wish it had more automated responses to attacks or Wi-Fi weirdness. It is good that it notifies you, but notifying and say locking down a new device until you approve it, I said that like three times already, would be good. Um, some kind of packet scanning to analyze traffic, like what is that Internet of Thing doing? Like is it sending data 24-7? Is it suddenly at two in the morning like hammering packets out? AE, is it part of a DDoS botnet? Um, Thingbox is interesting. But like most of the, we are internet security, you panicked user, spend $200 and $10 a month and we will protect you from the evil internet. We've we seen saw so many of those at CES. Oh, and last year too, right? Yep. The problem is, is none of these seem to be particularly complete. On the upside, one of the nice things about the Thingbox is it's 129 bucks. it has no monthly fee and it helps you see who's using your network and where the bandwidth is going and I suspect we'll add more features over time. Now of course, we should mention that you can do a lot of that type of data analysis mm -hmm. with software that's available on like Linux, right. you know, like like Wireshark and you know network <laughs> scanners. And there is nothing wrong Netcat. with learning Wireshark, but there is not a chance in hell I'm going to get my mom to run exactly. Wireshark and, the, at home. and that's yeah. and that's like they're they're hitting a target market mm -hmm. that you can't hit with Wireshark. So I think it's nice that we have that available to consumers. Yeah, and I will also say it's like you know the app for this. It's a lot simpler than like I'm going to log into my router and I'm going to yeah. look at my router and I'm going to go to click through three pages. It's like you open up the app and boom, this is everything on your network right now, which is kind of cool. So what if you're on vacation, like away from your network? Can you see stuff too? With the thing box, you can. Ah, cool. <laughs> and that's basically, okay. that's the cool thing about that is that you have remote access to that information. Cool. Um, you know, for example, right now, well, actually, well, of course I'm not going to be able to access it at home because it's right here. It's not connected <laughs> to the network. So you're just going to have to look at the pre-recorded video. Fing.io cool. slash Fingbox uh, is the website. It's available now. It's good, mm -hmm. but it's not everything. And I will say if you have like a $300 router or one of the more expensive mesh networks, take a look at what's buried inside of that. For example, the mm. ability to shut things on and off and stuff like that uh, may already be available to you. Let us know if you have any questions, ask at techthing.com, or you can tweet Patrick, he's at Patrick Norton. We got an email from Nick who writes, I am looking to get a 13 or 15 inch notebook with enough power to do graphics, web development, and very minimal video editing. I'd like an eighth generation Intel, but not opposed to AMD, but I want to pair it with an external GPU so I can also replace my outdated desktop and have the best of both worlds with mobility and power to play games again with my desktop peripherals, my large monitor, nice keyboard, and mouse. Mm. Hope that all makes sense. Have a great day from Nick. Oh my goodness. All right. I love this question. I do too. Because we have a surprise answer. Oh really? Well, okay, first of all, you're actually pretty happy editing on gaming laptops. Yes, I am. I've been very impressed with both the Alienware, which I'm currently using, this is the Alienware 13, and the uh, Razer Blade. And both mm -hmm. of those are running, I believe they are NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1060s in both of those. And I've been to have very comparable uh, times running both of them side by side as far as like rendering times mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Great laptops. And there's no head pounding over the performance or anything. No, there's not. Um, I've, I've had an awesome time with both of them. Other than <laughs> the old Razer Blade though, that was the one that I had purchased myself and I had, I had left click issues so I had to send it in and they sent me a right. new one. That was a pain in the bum. But otherwise everything's been going quite well. Not a processor or GPU issue. No, no Just it is not. <laughs> manufacturing flaw. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about um, toasters, which is what toasters. I call external <laughs> GPU Cylons? enclosures. Cylons? Should have worn my Cylon t-shirt. Well, here we go. This is uh, this is one that showed up uh, for a while last Whoa. year, right? This is kind of a classic Thunderbolt 3 external uh, GPU enclosure. Um, this is the Power Color Devil Box. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's end of life, and the reviews on it were pretty brutal, so don't feel bad about that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Another one out there that's pretty interesting, uh, this may have showed up briefly earlier in the show, uh, Gigabyte. They have a gaming box bundle that should work with any Thunderbolt 3 laptop. It's 600 bucks, but it has an embedded GTX 1070. I'm assuming like oh, cool. a mobile GTX 1070. Okay. Razer, which we've mentioned several times, uh, uh, has yes. the Core V2 Thunderbolt 3 external enclosure, enclosure, enclosure. Right. And that's $499 without the GPU, um, but apparently is large enough now to get most of the bigger GPUs. And you can see right there, look, there's a GPU in a box and yep. it connects to your laptop via Thunderbolt 3. And then uh, one of the more popular ones now is the Akito, uh, excuse me, Akitio Node, which is a Thunderbolt 3 eGPU for Windows. 
And apparently is also working uh, with Mac uh, boxes now too. Wow. A lot of good reviews uh, for that. Uh, and it's $245 without a GPU, which is really inexpensive. Mm -hmm. So at this point, you're like, I'm, I'm buying a, a laptop. Yeah. And then I'm buying an enclosure for a minimum of $245. Plus, you have to buy a GPU. Did we mention GPU availability being a problem earlier in the show? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think you're probably actually better off getting a laptop with built-in uh, mobile NVIDIA GTX graphics like we showed or Shannon talked about Aww. over there. Um, when, uh, you know, uh, our friends over at PC Perspective, Ryan and the crew, uh, did a review of NVIDIA's Pascal Mobile GTX 1080, 1070, and 1060 uh, when they came out back in August 2016. And check this stuff out. Wow. This is mobile versus desktop. These are synthetic benchmarks. But you notice they're awfully close. Yeah, they are. And then when you take a look at games, they are still, like, you know, you're looking within wow. four frames of each other. Okay, so GTA 5, you know, there's like a 10 frame difference. But essentially, you're talking about mobile graphics being at a parity or within like 10% of desktop that's graphics. That's awesome. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's pretty crazy from a laptop perspective. Yeah, totally. So I would suggest, right, because NVIDIA seems to have closed the game, the gap, right, between mobile and, and desktop C GPUs, not CPUs, um, I would really suggest you take a look at getting all of the graphics you want built into your laptop. Um, if you take a look at, like, um, GPU Bench, um, or like user benchmark, the GPU settings, like, you know, it looks like the performance is a little bit better uh, like for the 1060 mobile, the speed rank is like 35th versus 19th. Mm -hmm. But for the 1070, like it's 15th versus 12th. Like it seems oh, wow. as the GPU is very get, comparative. Yeah, extremely close. Um, so okay. I would get a laptop with the GPU performance you want built in um, because that way you avoid the cost of that external GPU enclosure, the possibility of Thunderbolt 3 driver issues with some people have run into, and uh, the cost of desktop graphics cards right now. Seriously, um, take a look at an NVIDIA GPU built into a laptop instead of an external enclosure uh, and a desktop GPU. Yeah, I had zero issues editing mm -hmm. on my Razer Blade during CES, and mm -hmm. I think that speaks volumes to how, how much yeah. you can do with a laptop these days. And it's gonna really perform well on a 2560 by 1440 monitor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yep. Maybe not on a 14, 14K, a 4K monitor. I've plugged in a big monitor to this Alienware uh, just to do some testing with uh, G-Sync, actually, and it works great. And we've also had the, um, peripherals plugged mm -hmm. into here, so I've had plenty of peripherals, mouse and keyboard and everything, so it works quite well. I've been very happy. Now that I've said that, I want to like double check to see what the XPS 15 with the high-end graphics costs. <laughs> Should we find out? Well, <laughs> I'm it's, scared. It's not exactly high-end. <laughs> Don't show me. A GTX 1050, <laughs> 1849. 1849, okay. You know, but that's also a pretty expensive laptop. Not bad. Well, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a tough time to be buying GPUs. Yes, before. it is. <laughs> All right. Remember once in a while, put down your phone, step away from the screen, close your laptop, and do something analog like Tyler, who writes, Hi, Shannon, Patrick, Darren, and the rest of the Tech Thing and Hack 5 crew. I am composing this letter informing you that your shows have been a beacon of inspiration in my IT academic pursuits. I am a third year computer information systems Bachelor of Science student currently attending the Northern Caribbean University located in Jamaica. And he goes on, I'm not sure if you realize the tremendous service you are doing in the field of information technology by producing these programs, but I want to let you know that you are doing such. I appreciate every computer bit of information that has spawned from your programs. I believe education is a sure, legit way out of poverty and shows one's true potential. Only one year of college left. Let the countdown begin. Wish me luck. Once again, thanks for all you do and God bless. Best regards from Tyler, and he says, P.S. My analog activity is practicing various forms of martial arts, such as Muay Thai, and hopefully I said that correctly, oh, from man. Tyler. And this is awesome, and your cat is adorable. I, that, I was laughing because that looks like our calico cat, Zeus. And I was like, once again, our cat is showing up in someone else's pictures. That's awesome. Thank you so much for the compliment. We yes, really, thank you so much. You know, and good luck on your last year. Don't get senioritis. No. Stay focused. <laughs> You're almost done. You're, you can do it, man. Take every internship you can get. Start applying for jobs now. Yep, I agree. And if anybody else has an analog pick that you want to share with the crew, definitely yes. email those over to us, ask at techthing.com, and just put analog, analog pick in the uh, subject line so we see it. Please do. I think that's it.
I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Day. You know, I took karate when I was a kid. Yeah? I didn't get very far. My wife taught karate for oh, that's years. That's right, she did. And then she got to study karate uh, for a while while she was teaching English in Japan. That's so cool. I think I only got to like, what's the, what's the second up belt? No idea. Yellow or something? I don't know. It wasn't very high at all. But I just took like, we must have gotten a deal on some cheap classes and my mom was like, oh, learn karate. So I took the free classes or the cheap classes and that was it. I like the Elvis <laughs> style of karate. It was <laughs> it was cool. Oh I'd like goodness. to learn more. Some self defense. Oh, Krav. Ah, oh yeah. Krav is the one that I think. There we go. Any any It'd martial be a good art? workout too. I need to I need to work out these guns. These guns. <laughs> <laughs> these wings of mine. <laughs> <laughs>